Give me eyes to see what your spirit is doing. Give me ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Give me a heart that understands your ways, O oh God. Give me eyes to see what your spirit is doing. Give me ears to hear what your spirit is saying. And above all, give me a heart that understands your ways, O oh God. This has been my prayer over and over and over in recent days. I especially want to understand the ways of God because they cannot be compared with the finite, limited, narrow-viewed of humanity and its ways. True? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us, My thoughts, God says, are nothing like your thoughts, just in case you wondered. And not only are my thoughts nothing like your thoughts, my ways <laughs> are far beyond anything you can imagine. Anything you can create in your mind, anything you can come up with, my ways go beyond that. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, that's pretty high, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Do we have any confusion right now? Are we all on the same page? Do we agree? Yes. All right. It is said about the Israelites that they knew the acts of God. They knew the power of God. But Moses knew the ways of God. He didn't just know about the power of God or the acts of God, but he knew the ways of God. For me, that means knowing his heart. And I want to be like Moses, who sought the ways of God. He sought the glory of God. He didn't just seek out the acts and power of God, but he had it all. And I want it all. <laughs> I want to see his power displayed. I want to see the acts of God moving in this earth. But I want to understand the ways of God and see his glory. And let's face it, the ways of God are mysterious. And so often he makes pathways where there aren't any pathways. Hello? God? And if he's not making paths where there aren't any, then he's taking us on this long, indirect, winding path. And we wonder if we're ever going to reach the destination. Do I have a witness on that? <laughs> I know that path really well. <laughs> And I want us to turn to Psalm 77. And of course, you all have your bulletin so you can cheat. <laughs> all right, we want to look at Psalm 77. And this was written by Asaph. I know you all thought David, but it's a song of Asaph, who was the leader of one of David's Levitical choirs, or more likely was actually one of his descendants. And it was written during the time of the Babylonian captivity. This was not a good time. This was not a fun time. Jerusalem was burned to the ground. The Israelites had been conquered. Not only was their favored city burned to the ground and destroyed, utterly destroyed, they were then taken from their land as captives and brought to Babylon. Woohoo! Fun times. And it is during this period that Asaph writes this. And if you remember in the captivity of Babylon, that's where Daniel was taken. That's where the three young men were taken Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or Meshach, your shack, and a bungalow. <laughs> it's one way to remember them. I'm just. <laughs> Psalm 77. We'll get serious, don't worry. Right now. Listen to this. I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. You don't let me sleep. I am too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days long since ended when my nights were filled with joyful songs. 
I search my soul and ponder the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? I mean, Asaph is so troubled in his spirit. He's distressed. He's anxious. And there were these intense questions that plagued his mind. And perhaps they are questions that you can relate to. Perhaps you are up in the night and wondering, has God rejected me? Has God forgotten his promises to me? Has he slammed the door of his mercy and compassion on me? God, I cry out in the night. I lift my hands up to you, and yet I hear nothing, and I wonder, where are you? Told you we got serious. (laughs) And some are calling into question everything they once believed. And some are even coming to the same conclusion as Asaph in verse 10. And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. Wow. Hmm. And so he, here he is, where many people are living today, believing that the very one who rescued them from the pit of darkness and despair and brought him out from the kingdom of darkness, has now turned his hand against them because of the circumstances of their lives, because life didn't turn out the way they thought it should. Hmm. (laughs) As if the last chapter of their lives has already been written. Are you still alive? The last chapter is not written yet. It is in God. (laughs) But see, Asaph, deep down, knew that that last chapter had not been written. And he continues with one of the most important three-letter words in the world. But. But. And I remember in Bible school, oh, so many years ago, (laughs) we had roommates. And there were things happening in Bible school that were grieving our spirits, and we were praying and believing God for breakthrough. And every morning, we would wake up and roll over and look across the room at each other and go, but God. There was nothing else to say. There was nothing else to believe or to stand on except but God. Verse 11, this is what Asaph did. But then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. O God, your ways are holy. O God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. And by your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. And so as Asaph sits writing in captivity, he remembers that once long ago, his people had been brought to Egypt and were in a place of captivity and bondage for more than 400 years, and yet God delivered delivered them. And here he sits in captivity now, remembering God did it once. He can do it again. Verse 16, and this is what he remembers. When the Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked and trembled. Oh, yeah. The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. And the earth trembled and shook. And your road, your way, led through the sea. Your pathway through the mighty waters. A pathway no one knew was there. And you led your people along that road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. And so Asaph pours out his complaint, his questions, and then he calms himself and he remembers the workings of God. And he concludes, your ways, O God, are holy. Your ways, O God, are beyond my understanding. 
How many times have you walked through shallow waters, and then when you look behind you, the path is closed up, and you can't see where you've come? Every time, isn't that? You, you know, every single time. And you see, God's footprints leave an impression for a moment. And then the path closes over them so they cannot be seen. And how many times has there been a footprint of God that we did not discern because we were so busy trying to reason it out with the natural mind, becoming anxious and full of doubts? Oh, God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? What are you going to do? Well, he just did something. You missed it. <laughs> you know? And in those times, we need to talk to our souls. And you know I like to do that. Soul, listen up. The Word of God says... The Word of God says, God's way is perfect, and all the Lord's promises prove true. Psalm 18, verse 30. Soul, you better get in line with God's Word. Soul, you better submit to the Spirit of God. Soul, get your emotions in check. Oh, amen. A lot more men saying amen at that. <laughs> Mind, think on those things which are true and lovely and pure and just. Amen? Get your mind out of the negative rut and begin to meditate on the promises of God Almighty and the truth of his word. Soul, be quiet. <laughs> Why are you so downcast within me? Put your hope in God. And this is what Asaph did. And so Asaph looks back to the miraculous deliverance that God brought through his power. And you know, the path of God's power is mysterious. It is mysterious. It is beyond what they could have imagined that time of the deliverance from Egypt. After years and generations of slavery in Egypt, God raises up Moses to lead the people out of their bondage. And, of course, Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. And so through the ten plagues, with the final being the killing of the firstborn, Pharaoh finally breaks down and says, Exodus 12, 31, Get out! <laughs> Leave my people! Take the rest of the Israelites with you! Go and worship the Lord as you have requested! Get out of my sight! And so the people leave. But when the shock and the horror of the night begins to wear off, Pharaoh realizes what he's just done. He's lost all his slave labor. He's lost his slave labor. And so he orders his horses, his chariots, the horsemen, the troops to pursue the Israelites. And meanwhile, back at the camp by the Red Sea, the Israelites are rejoicing. They're singing and dancing because of their newfound freedom. They're rejoicing over the deliverance that they have just experienced. But wait, what's that sound? There's a rumble. There's a rumble. What is it? It sounds like thunder. No, there's dust in the air, there's hoofbeats coming, and then there's this army. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the ground is beginning to shake as they approach. The Egyptians coming to reclaim them for bondage and slavery. And suddenly the Israelites turn to Moses. Moses, what have you done? Have you led us out here so that we could dig our own graves? Have you brought us here so we could die? Moses, what are we supposed to do? Moses, where are we going to go? Moses, answer us. Moses, Moses, give us answers. Moses, it would have been better for us to stay in Egypt. And suddenly bondage seems okay. Oh, because it's familiar. It's predictable. We know what to expect. But freedom, we don't know what to expect. We don't know where it's going to take us. We don't know what battles we're going to have to fight. And so bondage looks good. Well, there's a whole other sermon there. <laughs> so what was Moses supposed to do? The army is coming. <laughs> Before them is the Red Sea. Not a lot of options. <laughs> and he's got a couple of million people with him. Moses had no prior experience to which he could turn to for answers. Right? I mean, this was something completely new. Uh, God, 
uh, how are you going to do this, right? He didn't have any human experience to look back to. He had no frame of reference to know how God could or would move on their behalf. But Moses knew the ways of God. Moses knew the ways of God, and he told the people. You see, he knew the I am. He told them in Exodus 14, 13 and 14, Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. What? Are you kidding me? Stay calm? Stand still? Do you see what I see? Hello? Whoa! <laughs> Just stand still and calm down. Yeah. All right. Might as well try it. <laughs> and God unfolds this mysterious path of power in this wonderful way as the rumblings grew stronger and stronger and closer and closer. Exodus 14, 19 to 22. Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea. Remember that? Hair blowing, robes blowing. All right. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't just his hand, it was the rod. <clears throat> all right. Okay. Oh, boy. So Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through water with a strong east wind. And that wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls, water on both sides. Wow, this is cool. Man, I would never have thought of that. God is so awesome. He's like, wow. And what do you say? You, wow. Oh, you know, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I saw that one coming. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, his ways are beyond. You see, God moved in a way that was so beyond their imagination. They couldn't have thought of that. They had never experienced it. He made a path where there was absolutely no path. God will make a way where there is no way. Old but good song. You see, all too often we place God and his power in this box of our own limited experience and our imagination. And one of the things I wanted to do this morning is buy and bring everybody a little box <laughs> so that we could crush it. <laughs> That would have been so fun. You know, just take God out of your little box. He doesn't fit. I'm just letting you know, he, does, he can't even get his little pinky in there. <laughs> that would have been such a prophetic act. We could have all stood and just, whoa. Another time. Go home, find a box, have a great time. Have a party with God and let him out. Just let him out. <laughs> you know? Sometimes we decide that God's going to do something this way because that's what he did before. Oh, am I only the one that's guilty of that? Oh, I am. Okay, I'll work on that. <laughs> so God is limitless in his power and his creativity. Sometimes we think we're so creative. <laughs> and we are. We are. But God, you know, it's just like you, over the top and then some, right? You know, he might do something the same way, but he's not limited to it. He didn't deliver the Israelites from ba the Babylonian captivity the same way he delivered them from Egypt. It was a completely different way. 
And so what is, you know, the past experiences are important, aren't they? We look back to them for encouragement. We look back to them to say, you know, God did it. He can do it again. But it doesn't mean he has to do it the same way. It's just I know that God is able. He's able to do that which is impossible. And some of you have experienced it in your lives. You've experienced it in your bodies through healing. You've experienced it in circumstances in your life where God of the impossible intervened and did things that you couldn't even imagine. And today you're sitting here with thankful hearts because of God and what he's done. You know, what did Asaph do in those difficult circumstances? He looked back. He looked back. Psalm 77, we reread it, verses 11. But then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I recall what you have done. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They're constantly in my thoughts. I can't stop thinking about your mighty works. Oh God, your ways are holy. And when we get into places in our lives where the enemy is beating us down and bringing such negative thoughts into our minds over and over that how can God do it? And it's not going to be, just tell him, shut up. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> be quiet. Be still. Okay. De depending what translation, right? No, listen, we've got to stop taking that. And we begin, to, we begin to train our minds. We begin to renew our minds, giving thanks. You know what? God saved me. He delivered me out of darkness. He delivered me from a life that was going nowhere. He delivered me from myself. He delivered me from going down to a pit that I would never come back out of. And we remember those things and give thanks. You see, that's, that's what Asaph does, and that's what a lot of people do, but here's what I do. Oh, God, I know that you are the great and awesome God who has created all the universe and everything that is in it, and so I know that you're going to go do this, and then you're going to do that, then you're going to remove this obstacle, you're going to open that door, and then you're going to bring me through here, and then you're going to finish it off with a bang! Oh, that's what I do. I've got it all figured out. Because this thing is always working. Always working. Always working. Got to figure out how's it goes. It's like, ooh, be still. And know that He is God. And you know, when all is said and done, very little, if anything, is done that way. How many times have you thought, oh, God's going to move this way? And you're like, oh, he, he, he went that way. <laughs> God is too big to fit in our little boxes. He's too great for us to have them all figured out. Let's just burst that little balloon right now. I can't figure you out. See, men, it's, <laughs> it's not that you can't just figure out your women. You also can't figure out God. <laughs> you know I'm teasing. <laughs> Just when you think you've got it all figured out, something different happens. Both with women and God. <laughs> Listen, are you up against something that's too big for you? Are you wondering how God is going to come through? How God is going to take care of it? Yours is not to know how, but to know that he will. Not to know how, but to know that God will. God will. God will. And so it comes down to an issue of faith and trust. Doesn't it always come back to that? Not to know how, but to know he will. And see, the best way for us to get above our circumstances is to surrender ourselves into God's hands. Because once we've surrendered ourselves to God's hands, remember, he is seated in heavenly places, and so are we with him. 
Therefore, we are above the circumstances. And we do not allow the circumstances to dictate our future, to dictate our responses, to dictate our emotions, to dictate our attitudes. We allow the fact that we are surrendered to a God who loves us beyond reason, <laughs> knowing that he's not going to let us down. No matter what we're facing, no matter what pain we are in, no matter what suffering we are going through, he is Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 43, verse 2, one of my favorites, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you because I am Emmanuel. When you go through rivers, it's not in your bulletin. Uh -huh. When you go through, pull out your Bible. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. So get up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror, and say, you, as you go through those waters, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to drown. You, as you face the fires of oppression, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to be burned up because Emmanuel, God is with me. All right? We need to change our speech so we can change our behavior. But even more so, attitudes and all of those things. All right? See, the, path, the power of God may follow a path that we don't know or understand. But we can always know that it's his love that guides us on it and will ultimately lead us into freedom and his purpose. So God's power creates paths where there aren't any. But you know, his wisdom <laughs> also has pathways, and these are mo oh, most often the indirect, winding, long, forever, ever, ever pathways, <laughs> or so we think, right? Right? And it's the mysterious path of God's wisdom. It's a path that challenges our understanding all the time. All the time. Remember that we read earlier, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. And we're told in Romans 11, verses 33 and 34, excuse me. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Mm -hmm. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? I'm trying it all the time. <laughs> and that's what he does. He laughs. <laughs> Therefore, he says in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. You see, our finite minds cannot comprehend the plans of God in their fullness or his wisdom in all its facets. Remember, we see through a glass darkly. We prophesy in part. So if anybody comes to you prophesying and they think they've got it all, just say, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Because they got a tiny piece. A tiny piece. That was a side note. Free. When it comes to the mysterious path of God's wisdom, um, I do. I find it winding. I find it indirect. And yet he accomplishes his purpose. You know, there seems to be detours, delays, impasses, blockades, construction, construction, construction. Construction, and even more construction. Deconstruction, reconstruction. <laughs> Welcome to Quebec. <laughs> and when I think of this winding, indirect path, you know who I think of? Joseph. Oh. <laughs> Joseph. We meet Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 as a young man, 17 years old. And through two dreams, God speaks to him about his future of coming into a place of prestige and position and power. And in all of his 17-year-old wisdom, <laughs> glory to God, that's right. He tells his brothers and parents about these dreams that God has given him and how one day they're going to bow before him. Yeah, that went over well. 
So the brothers who were already jealous of Joseph and his favor now hate him all the more. And so now they plot to get rid of him. <laughs> and when the opportunity presented itself, they threw him into a cistern <laughs> and faked his death. A band of Midianite merchants come along, and they're like, slave for sale, young, healthy, and strong for a good price. So the Midianites come, and they inspect. They prod. They inspect his teeth. They inspect his hands. They turn him around, just like cattle. <laughs> How much? 30 shekels, shekels. 30. Bah! Look at him sniveling, crying like a baby. I'll give you 10. 10? You kidding me? He's young. He's healthy. He's sturdy. He's going to give you many years of service. I'll take nothing less than 20. 20 it is. Sold. I, <laughs> you know, in the night I was thinking about that, the cruelty. We, I, I just, the cruelty that family can do. Yeah. It's unbelievable. They faked his death. They sold him as a slave. A slave. In a time that we can't even begin to imagine what that was like. And so he goes as a, you know, so they, they drive away. And you can just hear the taunts of the brothers. Bye-bye, Joe. Sweet dreams. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So much for position and prestige. He arrives in Egypt in shackles and as a slave. What about God's promises? What about his word? And yet God, in his infinite wisdom, took this winding and indirect path to fulfill his perfect purpose in Joseph's life. So he went from a son to a slave, and you know the rest of the story. He's falsely accused. He's sent to prison. And then one day, he is called upon to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And he's finding favor all along this pathway. As difficult, as painful, and as crazy as this pathway was, Joseph always had the favor of God with him. Because he kept his heart tender before God. And he refused to turn his heart against God. And he refused to say, God has forsaken me, and God has turned his hand against me. And if ever there was somebody that could say that, to me it would be Joseph. And I look at my life and what I experience, and I think, what are you crying about, girl? Pick yourself up. <laughs> Give yourself a good slap. And get on with it. <laughs> All right, that's just not the pastoral part of me coming out. All right. <laughs> And so he, in, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And so this path of God's wisdom leads to this moment where Pharaoh says to Joseph in Genesis 41, 41 to 43, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Ha, payback time. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring, which represented authority, from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing. Remember the coat he had lost? Right? And hung a gold chain around his neck. And he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down! So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And he said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Wow! Wow! <laughs> the suffering in comparison to what God brought... So from a favored son to a slave to a prisoner to second in command over all Egypt. Thirteen long years had passed since he had the dreams. Thirteen years. I mean, we read these stories sometimes and we think day to day. No, thirteen years. And it would be another eight years till the full fulfillment came when his brothers came and bowed before him. Such an indirect path. And yet the wisdom of God with the timing events was perfect and exact. You see, in our wisdom, we would have sent Joseph to the best schools for the best education, grooming him for leadership. 
Yes, of course. If it's going to be second in command in Egypt, he's got to learn it all. But God trained him in slavery and in prison <laughs> and directed his every step. And let's hope that's not the same for all of us. You see, because God doesn't always do the same thing, right? <laughs> this is where we don't want him to repeat. <laughs> see, even Joseph acknowledged God's leading when he confronted his brothers. Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Excuse me? So the slavery, the prison, the false accusation, being forgotten in prison, this was all meant for good, not evil. Oh, the enemy has a plan. But God has a greater plan. The enemy seeks to use the circumstances of your life to destroy you. God has a better plan. God has a much better plan. And he can take those things and redeem them and turn them around for his glory. You see, the suffering that Joseph had endured through those years on this strange path led him to a place where he could save the lives of many people. The lives of many people. And you have desires, you have hopes, you have dreams, you have promises, and you wonder because you seem to be further away from them when you first started out. I can attest to that in many different ways, and yet I know I'm on God's path. Though I do not understand, I know God is doing his work. Don't lose heart, because his ways are perfect, and everything we, we go through, he will use. But it's for a greater purpose than you. And if there's anything I want you to get today, it's this. God's work in your life is not just about you. I know that's shocking. Because each one of us thinks we're the center of the universe, the universe, university, the universe, or so we're the center of God. <laughs> God does things in your life for a purpose that is greater than you. For the saving of many lives. For bringing hope where there is no hope. Bringing light where there is darkness. Bringing love where there is hate. Bringing comfort where there is suffering. And so the things that you experience in this life, as difficult and as hard and as painful as they are, God can use them to bring hope and life to others. And if each one of us would begin to look at our lives beyond ourselves and begin to say, okay, God, I know that you want to do more than just what is in me. You want to do it for a greater purpose, then help me to see it. Help me to walk in it. It can't just be about me. If it is, wow. It's got to be greater touching and saving of lives. See, the detours that our lives take bring us on paths that we would never have otherwise seen and touch lives that we would never have otherwise touched. And I think of the Apostle Paul. I mean, lit, just read his life. Study his life. He was beaten. He was whipped. His feet were beaten over and over again. And yet he walked. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a horse and buggy. He walked the entire known world at that time, preaching the gospel, even though his feet had been beaten and beaten. Because there was a greater purpose for his suffering. And he would not be stopped. And we have to determine, no matter what's taking place in our lives, no matter what our circumstances look like, we are going to stand and decide that we're moving ahead with God, and we are moving ahead with his kingdom, and we are going to take lives for his kingdom. We're going to minister to people who are down and out. We're going to bring comfort. We're going to bring love. We're going to bring light. Because we've been set free so that we can live, we can love, and we can go forth. So we can be the people God's called us to be. Amen? Amen? 
I remember years ago when God asked me two questions, which I've preached here and some of you remember. God asked me, am I good? I'm like, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> yeah, are you good? I mean, how could you even ask that question? God, you're good. Question number two, do you trust me? <laughs> okay, if the answer to question number one is yes, then by default, the answer to question number two has to be yes. And I stood there and got the shock of my life when I realized, oh, I had some trust issues with God. Me. <laughs> yeah, the, round, the ground rocked that day. It's like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Earthquake. <laughs> there are times when God chooses to deal with us by methods that are hidden. And it has to be enough for us to simply know that he's acting on our behalf and for our good. You see, because God is good. And yes, I can trust him. Yes, I can trust him. And so I continually pray for a heart that understands his ways, even though I know they're past finding out. I think it comes down to wanting to embrace his ways, being sensitive to his ways, trusting his ways, even though I don't understand them. So what are we talking about then? It comes down to true, true godly discernment. Too many people use discernment to see what the enemy is doing. It's all about the enemy's work. True godly discernment begins with what is God doing? What is the Holy Spirit saying? What is the Holy Spirit doing? And then I'm going to move with him. And it's going to take care of the other things. And he's going to teach me when to deal with the enemy, the darkness, etc. If we reverse those, we are going to get into very uh, difficult territory. So discernment. And even though we can't understand God's ways with our natural minds, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And he knows the mind, and he knows the heart of Father. And he will lead us on the right path. We can trust him for that, no matter what those paths look like. And yes, I am so preaching to myself today. I always preach to myself first. And if you remember in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 12, do you remember that verse, no eye is seen, no ear is heard, no mind knows the things that God has prepared for them that love him? Too often we stop there. The verse goes on. But we have the Holy Spirit who knows and reveals these things to us. And that's where the discernment comes in. All right, so he knows the secrets of God, and he wants to reveal them to us if we would just depend upon him. And like I said, the thing I want you to keep in mind this morning is God's plan for your life goes beyond you. It goes beyond you. And he wants to bring you across, across places and people that you would not have otherwise touched if you were on a direct path. This is the mission. i got to go there. That's me. Task. Let's just get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whole regions were touched with the gospel because of Paul having to do this. Whole regions. And so this morning I want to say open the box, destroy the box. Amen? Now, I'm going to put you on the spot. I want about four or five people to tell me something that touched them today. I want some feedback. Five people, raise your hands. <laughs> In other words, did you hear? I was really encouraged by um, just thinking that God can really use the things that seemed really destructive for his good. And... Uh, it really uh, encouraged me today. Amen. Somebody else. What did God speak? Well, that our lives are not our own, 
and that the journeys that we go on, the journey that we're on, the stuff that God brings us through is not for us, and the gifts even that he blesses us with, the life that he has for us, is not ours. It's for him and to be used by him to touch other people. When God uses a gift of healing through me, who's the gift for? It's not for me. I'll come back to you. Charmaine? Putting you all on the spot now, eh? Some of you getting nervous. <laughs> it was uh, right at the beginning when you were saying, um, I searched for the Lord and I prayed all night. I wasn't comforted and has the Lord turned his back on me? Mm. It's like, but then I remember all the other stuff he did do. Yes. Awesome. Two more? I'll come, come back to... I'll come back to you, Shaheen. Mary, too? Okay, so three more. Yeah, uh, the, the Hebrew 10, 35 says, never to give up our confidence, our fearless confidence, because there is a great compensation, a great reward. Mary? Just your two questions that God had asked you, you know, am I good? Yes, of course. And, well, then do you trust me? That, and that, you mean I have trust issues? You know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shiny. Uh, I learned now today, whatever circumstances are there, we have to trust on the God. And many times it's happened, the what circumstances is there, uh, I feel like I will give myself to him, and he will give me the way, the which way I'm going to walk. Amen. Amen. Awesome. See, I, I'm, I'm in a place in my life that I don't want to preach just to preach. Um, the word transforms. <laughs> We'd have such a party. <laughs> We'd have a party. <laughs> uh, let me just say this morning, for those who are watching by live stream, you may not have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to encourage you today to know that God is good, and you can absolutely trust him. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what you're suffering with, no matter what you find yourself in the circumstances. God is able to deliver you. He's able to bring you through those waters because he will go with you through them. You see, he didn't tell us that he's going to take us out of those, but he would go with us through them and that we would not drown in them. And so I want you to know today that Jesus Christ is the best friend you could ever have, but he is more than that. He is more than that. He's a savior that saves us out of darkness, the kingdom of the enemy that rules all around this world. He takes us out of that darkness and brings us into a kingdom of love as a savior. But he is also Lord. He is the king of kings. And so when you give your life to him, you're saying, I surrender my life to you, and I'm asking you to direct my life. I'm asking you to take charge of my life because what I've done so far hasn't worked. There's something better for you. And so what I would encourage you to lift your voice up to God and just say, God, I want to give my life to you. I know I've messed up. I know I've sinned. I know that you came and you died on that cross so that I could have real life. And it's that life I want. And so I'm giving you my life and my heart. Amen. We already had some prayer time at, uh, during the worship concerning lifting off burdens and, and discouragement and stuff. But I want to open it up this morning that if you uh, would like prayer, something specific, you don't have to come to make me feel good. Okay? But I'm saying if, if you didn't come earlier and you were kind of like, oh, maybe I should have gone up, and something in this message began to stir in you, then you are more than welcome to come. We'll pray with you, believe with you, uh, encourage you. And that's my heart today. I wanted to encourage the body of Christ. I wanted to build you up today so that you would stand strong. Amen. So let's stand and pray. And if you want to come, you can come. If not, we're officially dismissed. So, Father, we thank you for the preciousness of your word that brings strength and life to us. It's, it's our bread. 
It's the very thing that we depend upon for life. And Father, I ask that the seed of your word will have gone into hearts that were ready to receive it and that it would uh, be planted deep within and take root and grow and become strong in their lives so that when the winds, uh, the winds and the storms of this life come, they will remember, they will remember but God, but God, and that you are able to do much more than we could ever think or imagine or hope for. And that you, God, take all these things in our lives and you redeem them and you use them to bring glory to your name so that the nations would know that you indeed are God. Amen.